Hello, product people. Welcome to the Product for Product podcast, hosted by Matt Green, data advocate and product manager, and Masha Mikanovsky, product leader and author. Our goal is to serve the product community by helping you find products that can help make your work in product management easier. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Product for Product podcast. Welcome back. On today's episode, we'll be discussing the collaborative design tool Miro and how it's being used to help product managers. We are happy to have Rob Hall on the show to talk about his experience with Miro. Rob is the director of product at Oxblue. So welcome to the show, Rob. Hey, guys. Thank you, Matt. Great to have you here. I really appreciate it. Hey, Rob. Uh, hey, Matt. Nice having you here. Hey, Moshe. Moshe, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. And awesome. uh, you guys are fellow uh, um, Atlantanian? Is Atlant- that how you say it? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Atlantans, uh, Georgians. Atlantans, yeah. Yeah, Georgians. It's- it's, yeah. it's there's many weird descriptors you can yeah. use for us and, and we grew and, and we grew up outside of atlanta so we're uh yeah. outside the perimeter uh suburban yeah otps yeah otpers so nice uh, next time i visit in atlanta it's been a while like for a very long time but next time i visit uh we have to meet all of us oh yes that'd be awesome <laughs> really, to talk more really cool. to talk more product and maybe build something together oh that'd be sweet <laughs> that'd be fun yeah. yeah, yeah, and maybe drink some Coke. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of that in here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, in the introduction, Matt, you mentioned that we're talking about Miro. Miro is a very wide, broad uh, product that is used for really wide boarding and collaboration. Right. What we want to focus on is more how to how using Miro for you know what this series is all about, which is UX UI design and wireframing. So that's really our focus today. Although I'm mm-hmm. sure we will talk a bit more about Miro in general. Um, so first of all, uh, Rob, tell us about yourself. Sure. So um, again, thanks for having me on the show. Um, so I've been in product management for uh, a little over a decade now. Um, it's it's funny, like a lot of product managers that I've run into over the years, uh, my background has absolutely nothing to do with product management. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I was actually um, kind of trained as a music educator uh, and but I ended up changing my major, I don't know, three or four times in college. I kind of bounced between music education and film production and then finally landed in business. Uh, and I, I changed so many times I eventually ran out of money and had to go to work. And um, and I realized I was getting a better business education just working uh, professionally than than I was, was getting in school. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I was always very close to technology growing up. I was uh, probably one of the first kids I knew that had an email address. Um, <laughs> I was a Mac fanboy when I was a little kid. I mean, I, I've just I've been around technology for a very long time. Uh, taught myself to program using Basic, and then later HyperCard, if you know what that is, in the in the nineties. And then um, probably early two thousands, I taught myself HTML uh, and a little bit of CSS, and so I knew how mm. to build basic web pages and things like that. Mm. Um, and so my career kind of bounced around. And, and oddly enough, started out in construction, um, doing some IT work and mm-hmm. some consulting and some like light database management and things like that, where I was able to use my technology skills uh, in a more professional setting. Uh, and then when the Great Recession hit around 2008, 2009, I had to go back to the drawing board and kind of figure out who am I, what am I doing um mm-hmm. where am i going with my career <laughs> yeah <laughs> which end is up which end is down i don't know yeah. uh, mm-hmm. but it, it gave me an opportunity to really reflect on my skill set and think about what am i really good at that i can do all day every day mm-hmm. and it went back to okay well i i'm good with computers i'm good with technology i have a a, a decent skill set around that uh what can i do to make that marketable so i started building web pages. I started building uh, websites using WordPress and Magento, if you remember what that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, I built, uh, I I took on some freelance clients, started building a a business and uh, built a number of of products that uh, were, I guess, very early for iPad and iPhone uh, for a couple of my clients. And then from there, I ended up going to work uh, for a number of agencies doing product management for other companies. Mm -hmm. And 
I didn't realize at the time that product management was what I was doing. My title was always something else, at least mm-hmm. early on. And mm-hmm. and I think at that time, you know, around 2010, 2011, product management formally had a, a, a bit of a different connotation. It was marketing. Uh, yeah, it, it was either marketing or it was it was more hardware and manufacturing centric. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and less around software. If you were a software product manager, you were a project manager or a program manager, maybe. Um, mm-hmm. but I realized over time that, wait, this is, this is product management. That's what mm-hmm. I'm doing. And, uh, I just kept at it and over time ended up kind of finding my niche, which is building teams and process from the ground up. And mm-hmm. so I've, I've kind of walked through that um, experienced several times now where I've come into an organization that either, uh, had immature processes or an immature team or no team at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and have kind of helped define here's what, what our approach to product design and management ought to be. Here's how we ought to release products to the market. Here's how we ought to, uh, create a customer feedback loop. Here's how we ought to implement that learning, uh, help the team move faster and get smarter and serve our customers better. Yeah. Um, and I love it. I, I love that introduction because, um, you know, many people are thinking they have to come from a specific background to be product managers. Right. And it just shows that uh, that's not really true. Not yeah, at all. It's, it's, exactly. not, it's more about what you do rather than where you come from. Exactly right. Yes. Yeah. And, and I tell people all the time, if you are good at bringing people together and helping people get on the same page, about mm-hmm. which direction to go, you might be really good at product management. Right, right. That's that's a good, that's a good way to do it. It's like a shepherd. <laughs> yep, totally. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a shepherd. Um, cool. So you're you've been using Miro for how long? Oh gosh, uh, probably over five years now. I've been mm-hmm. using it since it was called Real Time Board. Ah, I didn't oh, even wow. know that it was a different name. Yep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you, if if you have a paid account and you get an invoice at the very bottom, it still says Miro DBA or Real Time Board uh, DBA Miro. Yeah. So it's uh, okay. still, still so, buried in their DNA. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So tell us a bit about you know the progression. I'm sure you started as a whiteboard to do some workflows and work totally. with people together. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you progress from that to actually uh, what we're talking about here, the wireframing and the design of your applications? Sure. So, it, you know, I, originally, I think it very much began as just a, a virtual whiteboarding tool for us mm-hmm. um, where, OK, we're standing at a whiteboard and we're sketching out a lot of things and trying to create some workflow diagrams, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, even before COVID, I guess, right? Five years. So uh, oh, absolutely. Before. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we were we started using this uh, previous uh, company way mm-hmm. before COVID. Yeah. Uh, and, and at that time, we were really just using it, trying to capture and, and organize what we were uh, what we were creating in the physical realm on right. a, a literal. And sometimes it was just photographs of the whiteboard that we were uploading and, and uh, dragging mm-hmm. and dropping into Miro. Mm, uh, right. But right. but even early on, it was a great collaboration tool um, because you could you could just throw anything at it and organize it however you wanted and put multiple people in there and everyone could could kind of create this dumpster of of brain matter yep. <laughs> and and do whatever you need to do with it yeah um over time however it it's real utility uh at least for me has started to shine in being able to structure and run uh design workshops design thinking mm-hmm. exercises mm-hmm. Um, design sprints mm-hmm. it's become very very uh invaluable as a tool for for at least performing um the the research and discovery portion of our design process i mean it, today i'd say if there is a workshop to be run in any in any measure even in the office um we will use miro for it mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. it's just it's too easy for people to be able to to share their their thought yep. processes and yep. to capture that learning um, to, to try and yeah. do anything other than that. Right. Right. It's a good repository for that. Right. Oh, huge. Yeah. Yep. And, mm-hmm. and they've done a very nice job creating a lot of templates around kind of popular exercises and workshops. So we don't have to do a whole lot of heavy lifting to get mm-hmm. started. You can just, sometimes it's it. actually, when I'm looking for a template, I see too many of them and I'm like, okay, so which one should I really use? <laughs> mm-hmm. There are so many. <laughs> Absolutely. And sometimes I'm like, you know what? Some of these are overkill. I'm just, I need to create a few yeah, frames. It's on and... basic, right? True. Yeah, sure. right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but but really, you know, a couple of things that we focus on using it for today, uh, like I mentioned, UX research and collaboration. So um, mm-hmm. I, I make a point of saying if we're to the entire team, if we're learning something, it had better be in the Miro board. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, if it's not there, we haven't learned it. Mm-hmm. And, and I do that. I do that mainly because it not just because of its power, but because of the ease of use of throwing anybody in it and being able to 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 digest what has been learned in a mm-hmm. sequential sort of way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very difficult to say, OK, we've got a document over there and, you know, there's 25 folders in Google Drive and there's probably. Probably yeah. 50 yeah. slide decks and everything's just scattered and fragmented all over the place. And yeah. by structuring yeah. all of that learning in Miro, it just, it creates a, a nice centralized place mm-hmm. of course uh, that can, you know, and, and when we utilize various integrations like the Google drive integration, we can bring those different documents and artifacts together there. Um, but it's still, I, I insist upon, upon putting everything in Miro. We also use it for story mapping. So if we're if we've gotten past kind of an early point in research where we say, okay, let's get serious about about starting to define some sort of solution here, mm-hmm. uh, we'll do some collaborative story mapping exercises with Miro. Um, we certainly use it for workflow diagramming, and then we will do some light wireframing with it. And I think it's kind of where I would draw the line between Miro as a UX tool and a mm-hmm. versus it being a ui tool like figma or adobe xd right Let's say it, it really comes down to the matter of fidelity i think miro's fine for creating um say really low-fi wireframes that are in context with the workflow diagram that we're creating right uh, but mm-hmm. i would not attempt to ever use it for high fidelity visual UI. designs yes right yeah it just yeah. It is, it is not made for that so it's the UX portion of things. It's the yes. uh, wireframing portion of things. It's not the design itself. That's right. right. And and I would say even with wireframing, even lo-fi wireframing, there's limitations to it. Um, and mainly because we, a big part of our process at Oxblue is clickable prototyping. If I'm really going to get meaningful feedback from, from customers, whether that's the end user or an internal uh, person on the team, I want them to be able to have as close to a real experience as possible when they're testing whatever the thing is. That's and uh, and that's not something you can do in Miro. No, not effectively. No, mm-hmm. is that something you're doing in another tool? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. We you, we use Figma for all of our gotcha. UI. Gotcha. Uh, okay, and they integrate t- together well. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think there's there's room for improvement there. Okay. Um, and right. Yeah, now, what I, type of integration they have? Yeah. Well, that's I'm not, familiar. Familiar. I'm not yeah. familiar with that. Mm-hmm. We're probably using it wrong, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> right, right now, we're just dragging and dropping links between the two and, and uh, okay. Gonna go, okay, well, the link to the Figma board's here. Okay, so it's just a link integration, yes, uh, which is like any other type of links. Sure. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean there, there isn't stronger integration there. It's just more to say that if, if it if it works differently or, or is more robust, I, I don't know how to do that. Right. <laughs> Maybe there isn't, and that's a thing, right? That could be. Yeah. Um, one of the things that um, Miro actually added recently, I, I think it was last year or maybe the year before, but I'm sure it wasn't when you started it, with it, is actually the templates for wireframes. So and not a template for a whole board, but for uh, components. So they added like components specifically for wireframing. Uh, because I remember that they announced it. And I also showed recently to a designer uh, that um, I'm using Miro for wireframing, and she was like um, what? surprised that I'm using that because she didn't even know that that you could do that. <laughs> yeah, that's so, interesting. Yeah, so are you using those? No, no, we haven't been. And oh. you know, and I do know, like they've got the app wireframe. They've got uh, like a basic uh, yeah. iPhone app wireframe. I yeah. do like the the white for the whiteboard framing, uh, just because it it kind of has that stylized lo-fi look. So, is, okay. so what are you using exactly? That's that's what you're using. Just just uh, squares and and circles and stuff like that. Pretty much, because it's oh, easy. It's easy. It's what you know, right? And so, yeah. it's, and yeah. and typically, we're we're not trying to illustrate the entire experience. We're trying to pull out just individual pieces of an experience, right? Um, kind of micro interactions and that sort of thing. At least yeah. at that level. And yeah. so, 
just drawing a box and you know illustrating a table or you know just simple interactions are enough I at, see. That, at that yeah. phase yeah. yeah yeah their table functionality is actually quite interesting i find it different from tables in other systems that i'm using like you know word or whatever i, I think it's quite useful to illustrate and use it for lists uh, and pages and stuff like that Yes. Um, in their wireframing components, what they have is they have like drop down lists. So you can actually define the drop down list and then you can, you can define which of the items is like the selected one, which one is enabled and stuff like that. So it's a mere, it's a bit more robust than just saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm just putting some text here. Right. So, so it's actually, I, I, I use it recently for some wireframing that I'm doing. And um, and I found it um, quite useful, more than just like simple text and simple shapes. So they have like, you know, menus, they have um, uh, checkboxes, they have, you know, all the different types of, um, they don't have everything. There were right. a few things that, that um, uh, for example, I wanted like a drop down list that is also searchable. So I kind of had to construct it myself. <laughs> right, right. But, but um, that's the nice thing about the flexibility that you can do really whatever you want. Yeah, and it's it's neat that they do have kind of individual states for some of these objects, which is cool. So yes. like I'm looking at search bars, for example, and, and it's got a, a normal focused error disabled state. And you exactly. can toggle between them without having to to manually edit those. And that's that's pretty useful. Exactly. On useful. the other end, when you have to choose, for example, a button, a simple button, you don't have the ability to change the state from on and off or you know, let's say white on black or black on white or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they have two different components for that, which I'm not sure uh, why they did it that way. So you have to select it from the menu, either that one or that one. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's one of the things that I found. Um, and sorry for interject over there from my experience. You're the guest, not me. No, <laughs> I, hey, I, I just learned something new. So thank you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, it, it's just, it's funny because when you've used a tool for so long, it's easy to kind of get stuck in, in the pattern. way you do things. In the yeah, way, right. yeah, we've right. already the used way it, it works, this way. Right. And, and yeah, true. That. What true. do you mean there's new features? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and actually, because I was using it for so, uh, so much recently, um, they actually showed me that I can drag and drop a component library into the main menu on the left. So this way I don't always have to go and scroll down to find it. Amazing. So I actually, I actually did that, and now it's available right there for me. That's cool. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so that's another another small feature to to know that it's possible to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, would be wrong. That's, uh, that's mm -hmm. neat. There, there actually yeah. is a Miro plugin for Figma. So, yeah, um, so yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so uh, that's actually something. Um, uh, the, the the point the thing is the interesting thing is that Figma also released uh, FigJam, yes. and um, mm -hmm. last year <clears throat> uh, in the, in the previous place where I worked, um, the de designers used Figma, and the team used Miro. And then I did like wireframing in Miro, but the designers prefer to do wireframing in Figma. So all of a sudden we have two different systems, sorry, in FigJam. So all of a sudden we have two different systems that people are doing wireframing in. And um, is that, that's, you don't see that happens also at uh, your place? You know, it could always end up being the case where we transition but it's an interesting product management problem because mm -hmm. whenever you're in a, we run into the same thing where it's like, okay, the customer has solved this particular pain point using this particular method for so long. And mm -hmm. now I, I have this alternative method of helping mm -hmm. them solve the exact same problem. And right. I need to convince that customer that my it's way better. is better yes. <laughs> with, with an over to an overwhelming degree to prompt them to want to, to make that change. Yes. Right. And, and so I, I totally am in that problem when it comes to things like fig jam or envision or any other al alternative where I'm mm. like, okay, I, I know Miro, my team knows Miro more and more people in the organization are coming to appreciate Miro and are starting to use it. Mm -hmm. I see that there's an alternative that might have an advantage around integration with some part of our workflow, but is it enough to justify changing uh, as well as recognizing that we have this big body of work that is already in Miro that may or may not be able to transfer over. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we turn off Miro, do we lose all of that or have mm -hmm. to export it in some form where it's not nearly as, as usable? 
So there's considerations like that. And so far I haven't, I don't have awareness of a compelling enough value proposition on fig jams part to justify saying let's switch to fig jam or use both. Yeah. And I would certainly rather not use both. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that just makes our, 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 makes our it messy. point. Yeah. It makes it way messier. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. From what I've seen, I think that fig jam is not yet up to par with Miro. It's yeah. just that it's tightly uh, integrated, coupled, coupled with, with Figma yeah, sure. because it's the same product. And licensing-wise, it might also be easier, uh, you know, to, that you license only one product. But then right. if you have <laughs> other people other than designers in Figma, um, and, and usually in Miro, you have lots of other people, not just the designers. I'm not sure how licensing works for them if, if they don't use Figma, just just uh, Figma. But um, maybe that's something we will hear. Maybe people can send us feedback after they listen to this uh, episode. That would be awesome. Well, um, I think you almost bring up a, another interesting point, Moshe, around uh, the issue of standardization. Mm -hmm. and, and designers especially um, have strong opinions about the tools that they use. Yes. So, and I, I've mm -hmm. worked with, with many designers who swear by Adobe XD, who swear by figma or swear by something else sketch yeah. maybe mm -hmm. um and some of them are more flexible than others when it comes to transitioning between those tools but mm -hmm. there are some who's like no figma is where it's at i'm not using anything else forget right. about it and i want to kind of one of the cultural things i'm trying to create is this balance between standardization and flexibility and so i think when it comes to where do I do the actual UI design work? I want to remain as flexible as possible because I know that's where the bulk majority of a designer's time is going to be spent. Mm -hmm. However, when it comes to tools that affect a much broader selection of people in the organization, I want mm -hmm. a stronger sense of standardization. And so if I go all in on a fully integrated platform like Envision or Figma and FigJam, um, I kind of put designers into a box that can create some unnecessary friction it doesn't necessarily create value for the whole team. I don't mm -hmm. know what the right answer is. But that's yeah. kind of where we're landing on it. I think <laughs> it's still evolving for many companies for sure. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's talk a bit about collaboration because I think this is really the strongest part of Miro. Well, maybe other than the templates and the um, uh, richness or uh, of, of the functionalities and also the ease of use because it's pretty easy to start working with with Miro compared mm -hmm. to Figma or other system. But um, the collaboration, I think, is one of those things that, in my mind at least, uh, really helps in the wireframing and the UX process because we don't really do it on our own. We have to have feedback from people and we have to do it with other people as well. I love using it as a collaboration tool. And mm -hmm. I've, I've hosted kind of one-to-one -one calls using Miro where I'm just collaborating on on uh, affinitizing research with with another person, another product yeah. manager or designer. I've also hosted, you know, large workshops with 25 or 30 people in it all at once. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about it is it really seems to scale well, regardless of the number of people who are in in a session or a workshop at a time. Um, I've never had a problem, at least not recently, where I've had serious slowdowns in the in the app itself because I've had too many people involved doing things at the same time. It seems pretty pretty flexible yeah. and scalable yeah. in that regard. Yeah. Um, absolutely love using their built-in video chat. Um, I've found myself using that more than kind of our old standard behavior of setting up a Google meet call. And then everybody, well, now that we have the call in this window over here, let's get into Miro. And I'm like, what am I doing? That's why they have this built in. Let's, mm. let's use that. And it, oh, it's cool. fine. It, it works fine. And they do have an integration now for Google meet. So if you want to that platform, they'll, yeah. they'll pipe it in and make it part of the experience. I, we, you know, we don't really use the chat or the estimation functionality. Um, I, I think they're, they're nice features, but uh, we, you know, we have other processes and methods for doing estimation. Mm. I absolutely love the timer. It's such a simple little thing, yes. but it's so yes. handy when yes. I'm trying to keep a meeting or a workshop moving. And and it's funny because uh, it took some getting used to when I started doing timed workshops. Like, okay, I need everybody to throw out your sticky notes. You're going to write down two words and you have uh, 90 seconds. Ready, set, go. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like, what? Wait, you're timing it? Yeah, I'm timing it. We got to get this done. Let's yes. move. And uh, but it, it really it, it almost makes it fun because uh, mm-hmm. it's it's unexpected. And then, you know, you can if you want to add music, I think you can hook up your Spotify account and right and, wow. and pipe in some <laughs> some sick jams yeah. for your yes. uh, for your workshop. And I've seen that. I've seen that before. Yeah. And it just, it makes it more engaging and fun yeah, and the total and, experience. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Right. And I also use voting and voting also works really nice because you can set up how many um, votes every person get. Mm-hmm. Uh, because before I, I saw that they even have this feature, I um, created lots of uh, little sticky circles for people. Yep. With colors, yep. And I told them just move them around. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, but then you had to you had to manually then, count all the votes and yes, and so exactly. Forth. Yeah, the, it was the... so handy to do that, you know, with the with their voting uh, process. So it was really cool. But we were talking, you were talking about, um, you know, that you didn't notice it's slow. I must admit that right now I'm still with the new company I'm working at. We I'm still on the free version. Mm-hmm. And for the free version, you're um, only limited to you're limited to three editable uh, boards. Yep. So I'm using like I'm using them very sparely. <laughs> so I'm using one board for a lot of things, and because of that, it becomes so large that yep. it actually loads very slowly. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I, I, so, I had that happen uh, where kind of my initial Miro board at Oxblue it just became so unwieldy. I was like, okay, we're we're buying an account. This is yes, crazy. exactly. <laughs> I think that's what I, they they probably slow it down on purpose. So you will know, okay, <laughs> you did. Time, time you did upgrade. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've seen. I've had the same experience with it. Yeah, but you know, I don't know. It's been it was well worth the cost to be able to give the rest of the mm-hmm. team the ability to get in and create mirror yeah. boards and yeah. meetings and do all those things that of course uh, of course but one of the things about collaboration is actually that people participate in the collaboration it's one t- thing to have the tool it's another <laughs> thing that people don't use it it's yes. like just one person always do the same thing and i i also experienced that problem in the past where i would open it up and i would i would want the designers especially to collaborate on the wireframing while i'm doing the wireframing and they had the resistance to do it they wanted to take their time do it on their own do it without me in the room and stuff like that yeah and i felt that the collaboration is really being uh, hindered because of that right i you know i've tried to start every workshop by kind of giving the team the the rules of the road and mm-hmm. to say that mm. collaboration and and being engaged is a requirement for participation like mm. you you don't have a choice if you don't participate i will call you out mm. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. gently and politely of course but everybody and, and i just try to make the point that these activities don't work if everyone isn't participating, right. Right? that everyone's right. thoughts are important. Everyone's perspective is important. And the only way we're going to get smarter is if everybody's opening up and sharing. And, you know, I try to set some, some safety rules around that too. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. folks don't feel shy or afraid of About saying crit- something. criticism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want people yeah. to know that it's, it's okay for you to put your ideas out there, even if you're not confident in those right. ideas. Right. Let's go ahead and hop into the top three things that you really like using Miro for. My my top three are, are probably the most used things. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but but I'd say number one, sticky notes all day, every day. Yeah. <laughs> they, they make it so easy. Yep. Um, and they've added some, some new richness to how you can uh, manipulate and organize uh, sticky notes where, you know, you can tag them according to certain categories and then it will automatically... Um, sort those sticky notes uh, based on on the tagging criteria, and that's that's been really handy and a uh, nice improvement. Yep. Uh, um, second, I would just say is speed. Um, the the pace with which you can organize and build an incredible amount of content very quickly uh, from a lot of different sources, and frankly, just kind of sail smoothly across all of it uh, is is pretty wonderful. Um, and I don't know how they do it, but on the technical side, but they've they've done a nice job with that, making just a tool that's that's pretty performant. And yeah, it it can be unwieldy when you have you know say a massive uh, service map or something plotted yeah. out that that <laughs> uh, is genuinely huge. 
but I would say any any modern tool would probably struggle at that level. Yeah. Uh, um, and then the collaboration tools. Um, I think just the the ease of use when it comes to putting a bunch of people in in the board and and having them having people be able to follow along and interact and and contribute intuitively is has been very nice. Yeah, that's really <clears throat> cool. Yeah, one of the things I liked about it when I used it in the past was the ability to get updates on like what had happened when, after you left the board. Yes. And so I, that was a really cool feature that I enjoyed and something I don't don't see in Figma. Um, mm -hmm. And yep. even, even in uh, other systems that I've used in the past where if you do have a big board with a bunch of different things in it, uh, just being able to see what other people had done uh, and then offer feedback and be able to make comments and stuff like that is pretty cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of those features that I, I use regularly without realizing it. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just it's kind of become a part of my regular workflow as I yeah. just I, I hop into a board and I see and I immediately am examining what others have done to it. And that's, yep. yeah, it's helpful like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So on the opposite side of that, we asked three things that if you could talk to Miro, what would you like to see improved? Um, I would say number one, uh, text editing and sizing can be frustrating at mm, times. Mm -hmm. um, and it's they've got, true. yeah, it's <laughs> it can be very clunky, uh, especially if you're trying to to scale, kind of type text at a certain font. It's it's unclear how fonts are sized relative to the scaling of the board overall. Yeah. Uh, Especially when many people start at the same time, some of them will start with big mm -hmm. uh, fonts, some of them will start with small fonts, and you never know why. Exactly, and so mm -hmm. I would say, kind of related to that, number two is the scaling of the board, and any element within the board can be really tricky if you're not used to it. I, you know, I, I got into a board recently where there were screenshots from uh, some pieces of research that uh, one of my product managers was doing. And he had these, this really small text above it. Mm -hmm. And I went to increase the size of the text and it was already at a hundred point font. I'm going, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we've got a problem here guys. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, so that, and I don't know what the right answer is because they've, they've made an intentional decision to go full in on flexibility when it comes to scaling. And I understand that and appreciate it, mm -hmm. but I would think that there should be some sort of, some sort of smart guide mechanism that like baseline. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. Some sort of decent baseline to help mm -hmm. make elements relative to one another. Yeah. And, and yeah. that can also be problematic if you're creating a detailed workflow diagram Absolutely. or having to zoom way in to <laughs> yes. see, and then zoom way out. And, <laughs> and you can, I've made people, you know, kind of motion sick before giving presentations. Yeah. <laughs> like, Whoa, what is going on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I'd say the last thing, um, it does have some presentation capability where you can build different frames and sequence them as slides. Um, I've used it some, but it's it's really pretty immature at this stage. It is definitely not a replacement yet for Google Slides or PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. I would love it if it was because I would use it a whole lot more yeah. for, for presenting research and so forth. Yep. Uh, I would love to get away from kind of screenshotting workflow diagrams and things like that and pulling them into Google Slides. I'd love mm -hmm. to just leave everything in Miro and present it directly from there. It's a, these are great uh, points. I Probably if I had to think about it also, the, the scaling issue is would be the the, the biggest uh, yeah. pain point because they automate everything. Like all, they, they do this automation on the size based on mm -hmm. like your... Sticky notes and yes. stuff like that. Yes. Are you uh, integrating it with Jira or DevOps or anything like that? I have. Chance? We have experimented with the Jira integration before, and and ultimately decided to turn it off because we didn't get enough utility out of it. Mm -hmm. And that was probably two years ago that we experimented with it. So I'm I'm sure that integration has matured some since then. Mm -hmm. Um, but it just it didn't it didn't make enough sense. Yep. Um. Yeah, um, I think it's mostly to show the tickets rather to show that there is a link to the tickets. Yeah, right. So you can still put links in there to the tickets, but um, if you don't have the integration or even with the integration, I don't remember, I did it with IDL. Um, it was just showing um, all of them look the same. You didn't really know which ticket it is when you looked at the board. So you still had to open the tickets. Yeah, so I'm not sure if Jira is the same. I didn't try that yet. Very cool. cool. You know, that, that was um, our talk about wireframing and uh, UX mainly with uh, Miro. 
but we delve into lots of other uh, areas of Miro because it's a, such a, a rich um, product that mm-hmm. lots of people are using. And, and that's probably also why it became such a, um, a strong product in, in the world of software development and product development. I'm sure also hardware development and other things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and people are using it for many different uh, uh, needs, but um, for wireframing and, and for wireframing in general, I don't think many people use that. And that's why it was important for us to include that in the series. Yeah. Um, and to share that, yes, it is possible. It, it does fall within the range, but it does so many other different things. So uh, I'm glad we were able to talk about it. And, and Rob, thanks for coming on the show today. Really do appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. It was my pleasure, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Where, where can people uh, reach you? Uh, well, you can find me on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. That's honestly probably the best place. Where we all met. That's right. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. See you Take guys. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you to all the listeners. We really appreciate the feedback and support. Please leave us a review to help others find the show on Apple or Spotify or anywhere else you're listening to the show.